Today, we will be delving into the history of Rome's forgotten war on the steppe. In 49 AD, war came to the remote Roman client kingdom of the Cimmerian Bosporus. One of the many forgotten conflicts waged by the Roman Empire, this campaign would see them fight in defense of their allies and interests around what is today known as Crimea and the fertile plains around it, against warlike steppe tribesmen and rebels. The Kingdom of Bosporus had its origins in a wave of Greek colonists who arrived in Crimea during the 7th century BC. This was a time of intensive overseas exploration and settling among the ancient Greeks, who over the following century founded several colonies across the Mediterranean. However, there was also extensive colonization around the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea, or the Pontus as the latter was known to the Greeks. Unlike in the West, where Greeks from many different city-states would find new homes, the colonization around these two seas was entirely spearheaded by only two cities, Megara and Miletus. They may have even cooperated in these efforts, but if so, it remains uncertain. It was the colonists from Miletus who spearheaded the Greek settlements around the Black Sea. Over time, the Greeks would found a number of prosperous cities in the region, such as Pantikapaion, but the process was not easy. The local steppe tribes proved to be hostile to the newcomers, and the Greeks had to overcome firm initial resistance from the Scythians. Even after this, the colonists were engaged in a series of conflicts with the locals over the next few centuries, as the Greeks expanded their presence and formed relationships with what local peoples they could. It was not until 480 BC that a proper Greek realm was founded in the region, which became known as the Kingdom of Bosporus. The ancient historian Diodorus Siculus records that the first royal dynasty in the region reigned for 42 years, before they were deposed by the usurper king Spartacus, likely a Thracian, judging by his name. While the early history of the Bosporan kingdom may be hazy, what is clear is that it rapidly became very prosperous. The Greek colonists had found the area to be a lucrative source of grain, skins, and slaves, a characteristic of the region that would persist for the entire period. However, in the second century BC, the power of the Bosporans began to wane, Increasingly severe attacks from the neighboring Scythian tribes were becoming more difficult to contain, and the Bosporans were desperate enough to appeal for aid late in the century from King Mithridates VI, ruler of the Hellenistic kingdom of Pontus. He readily agreed to help the Bosporans defend their lands against the Scythian raids, and the region was thus absorbed into his expanding empire. For a time, this made Mithridates the dominant power in the Black Sea, but like so many others before him, his kingdom was to be dealt a crippling blow by the emerging Roman Republic. Over the course of the three Mithridatic Wars, the Romans steadily eroded Pontic strength, and in the final conflict, Mithridates was defeated by the great general Pompey. He then fled to the Bosporus in 66 BC, where three years later he committed suicide when his remaining power was undermined by a revolt led by his own son, Pharnaces. The Bosporan kingdom then fell within the sphere of influence of the Romans, and became one of its longest-lasting client kingdoms. Pharnaces became swept up in the internal turmoil of the Romans years later, as the Republic descended into civil war between Julius Caesar and his old ally Pompey. A small fleet of ships from the Pompeian navy attempted to sail to the Bosporus to arouse Pharnaces against Caesar after Pompey was defeated at Pharsalus in 48 BC. However, they never reached their intended destination, and ended up surrendering to Caesar. However, Pharnaces did attack the Romans the next year, seeking to take advantage of their seeming lapse in power to reclaim the territory lost by his father. While initially successful, Pharnaces was soon defeated by Caesar at Zela, and was then assassinated. In the century that followed, little of note happened in Bosporus, as it remained a pliant Roman client state, first for the Republic, and then the Empire. During the first century AD, Bosporus entered a new period of prosperity as it became a prominent supplier of grain for the city of Rome. The region was important enough for a permanent garrison to also be established there at some point, apparently from units second in there from Rome's large garrison at the Danube frontier. In 38 AD, King Mithridates III came to power in the Bosporan kingdom. At first, he ruled alongside his mother, Gepai Puris, but at some point, he was given full control of the Bosporus by the Roman Emperor Claudius. This event is a good example of how the political independence of the kingdom had waned, as a foreign leader was permitted to dictate who led the realm. However, 
In 45 AD, Mithridates was suddenly deposed and replaced by his younger brother Cotus. We do not truly know why this happened, but the Roman historian Tacitus does record that Mithridates considered Cotus to have betrayed him. In addition, Cotus clearly had the support of Rome, and Claudius also did not mind the fact that Mithridates was gone. It is possible that Rome supported Cotus in overthrowing his brother, perhaps after the ability and loyalty of Mithridates was called into question. Whatever the truth, Mithridates was bitter regardless, and was eager to retake his throne. In 49 AD, he gained exactly such an opportunity when he learned that most of the Roman garrison in Crimea had been withdrawn, along with their commander Aulus Didius Gallus. Only a few cohorts of auxiliaries were now left in the kingdom, commanded by an equestrian known as Caius Julius Aquila. Tacitus mentions that Mithridates also despised this man, suggesting he may have played a role in his downfall a few years earlier. Why the Romans withdrew so many troops from the region is also a mystery, but considering Mithridates was deposed and in exile, and the nearby tribes were quiet at the time, the need for a large force in Crimea was probably just seen as unnecessary. Seizing the chance, Mithridates enticed local deserters and some of the nearby steppe tribes to join him, either because of his prestige or perhaps his private wealth, or the chance to share in the riches of a successful campaign against a vulnerable but wealthy foe, many men joined the king in exile. Mithridates soon had a large army, with which he was able to overwhelm the tribe known as the Dandaridae, forcing their chieftain to flee into exile. Cotus and Aquila correctly suspected that they were next on his list. However, their available forces were limited, and were not deemed sufficient to defeat Mithridates on their own. It seems that the Romans and Bosporans were particularly lacking in cavalry, a troop type Mithridates likely had in abundance thanks to being able to recruit from the native steppe tribesmen. To make matters worse, Cotus and Aquila faced a war on two fronts, as the Syrakes tribe led by Zorsines had also declared war on them, perhaps also sensing an opportunity in the decrease of Roman troops in the area. Thus, the Romans were now forced to search for allies. They found a receptive audience in the Aorsi tribe and their chieftain Eudones, who was convinced to support Cotus and Aquila over Mithridates when envoys pointed out the great power of the Roman Empire, now to be arrayed against the rebel army. Eudones required little convincing beyond that. Having secured an alliance with Eudones, Cotus and Aquila could finally march out confidently to meet Mithridates in battle. Little is known of the size and composition of the allied army, but nevertheless, we can glean some details from the writings of Tacitus. Firstly, there was Aquila's own Roman forces, consisting of a few auxiliary cohorts, at most a few thousand men. These were probably regular auxiliary heavy infantry, equipped very similarly to Roman legionaries and fighting in the same style. They were flexible and effective troops, who were also skilled at siege warfare and engineering. Next was the Bosporan army, under the command of Cotus, which appears to have relied primarily on close order infantry. Tacitus gives us the intriguing detail that the Bosporans were equipped in the Roman style, something that was quite common in the armies of many Roman client states. Finally, there were the Aorsi under Eurones, whose forces were quite likely comprised entirely of cavalry, as was common for the tribes in the region. The Roman army, together with their allies, marched out towards the former lands of the Dandaridae. Eurones' cavalry was positioned at the van and rear of the column, and was ordered to deal with any enemy cavalry who might try to harass the Roman army in skirmishes. Meanwhile, it was decided that the Romans would deal with besieging enemy towns, as they anticipated encountering some fortified settlements. Details on the campaign against Mithridates are unfortunately sparse, but it appears that he was defeated in battle very quickly by the Romans, though we lack any details of this engagement. The allied army then marched upon the Dandaridae town of Soza, which had been evacuated by Mithridates beforehand and was taken without any resistance. However, the loyalty of the town's population was considered suspect, and so a garrison was left there to ensure its loyalty. Although Mithridates was still alive, he was now without an army or the resources and will to fight on, and was effectively neutralized. Cotus, Aquila, and Eurones next decided to march against the Syrakes, who had not yet made any moves against the allied forces, since Zorsines had hesitated about whether to ally himself with Mithridates or strike out on his own. The allied army crossed the river Panda without encountering serious resistance, 
and then besieged the fortified town of Uspe. This settlement was located on top of a hill and possessed a moat and walls. However, the latter were only made from wickerwork hurdles with earth packed in between. This may have been an adequate defense against the local tribes, who possessed little skill in sieges, but against the imperial Roman army, who excelled in this art, the defenses of Uspe were pathetic. The Romans built a series of siege towers which were used to overtop the enemy defenses and bombard them from above. Firing flaming missiles and shots from powerful bolt throwers, the Romans steadily reduced the walls of Uspe to wreckage, and only the coming of nightfall prevented the Romans from storming it on the very first day of the attack. On the following day, the Uspeans sent envoys to the Allied camp, offering them a peace treaty. In exchange for leaving the town unscathed, Uspe would hand over to them a huge sum of 10,000 slaves. However, the offer was rejected with little or no consideration, since the Allied army could ill afford to maintain so many prisoners of war. Thus, when the order was given for the assault to begin, the Roman and Allied soldiers were ordered to kill everyone on sight. None of the citizens of Uspe were to be spared. This brutal display terrified the nearby communities in the surrounding area, and convinced Zorsines to open negotiations with the Romans and their allies. The Syraces were forced to hand over hostages, and Zorsines also prostrated himself before the statue of the Emperor Claudius as a sign of his capitulation. This was considered an important victory for the Roman army by Tacitus, since not only had they overcome two enemies, but they had also advanced deep into previously unexplored territory, campaigning just three days' march from the River Don. With Mithridates and Zorsines both defeated, the war was effectively over, and the Allied armies returned to their own territories. Ironically, it was after the Romans had won the war that they suffered their first notable reverse. During the journey back to Bosporus, the transport ships carrying one of the auxiliary cohorts were run aground, scattering the Roman soldiers and making them vulnerable. The locals seized upon the opportunity to attack, and the cohort was heavily mauled, even suffering the death of its commander, though the rest of the survivors appeared to have made it to safety. But this ultimately minor setback was certainly not enough to change the course of the war for Mithridates, and he began to consider to whom he should surrender. He despised and distrusted Cotus, and did not trust any of the Roman officials at Bosporus to be influential enough to guarantee his safety, so he decided to surrender to a relative stranger, Eunones of the Aorsi. The king put up his best appearance and arrived at the Aorsi court, asking for sanctuary and mercy. His plea moved Eunones deeply, who sent a letter to Claudius advising him to spare Mithridates. The emperor was at first inclined to recapture Mithridates for execution, by force if necessary. However, others advised him to instead accept Eunones' suggestion. Mithridates would serve as a sign of Roman clemency and as a symbol of their victory. Furthermore, a protracted war in the area was deemed to be pointless, as there was no real strategic value in the steppe, and operations there were made more difficult by a lack of established roads and harbors. Mithridates went into custody of Junius Clio, the procurator of Pontus, from where he was eventually sent to Rome. He appears to have lived out the rest of his days there in comfort, although he initially at least behaved with a surprising degree of arrogance, even when he was publicly displayed at the Roman Forum by Claudius. Whatever his attitude, the surrender of the Kenan exile marked the symbolic, if not true, end of the war on the steppe. Cotus would continue to rule the Bosporan kingdom for several years, until in 63 AD, when the Emperor Nero decided to absorb his kingdom into the Roman provincial structure. His decision, however, was reversed in 68 AD following his death, and Bosporus was handed back to Cotus's son. Aquila largely fades away from the historical records at this point, though we do know he served as a praetor in Rome after his successes against Mithridates and the Syraces. Eurones also gained much from his new alliance with Rome, boosting his prestige, wealth, and power considerably. The kingdom of Bosporus itself would continue to endure for a long time. However, over the next few centuries, its power began to weaken, until around the 4th century AD it collapsed completely, perhaps at the hands of the Huns. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like the video and subscribe for more content on ancient Rome, and check out my other social media in the links below. See you in the next one.